Okay, now, with regards to the immigrant experience, to make, and this is since the 1990s, to make matters worse for the immigrant, 9-11 occurred. So a stunned Congress is going to respond to what happened uh, on September 11th, 2001. Um, they will pass the Patriot Act, and they pass the Patriot Act without reading it. So according to immigration laws, the U.S. Patriot Act is an acronym that stands for Uniting and Strengthening America by Providing Appropriate Tools Required to Intercept and Obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001. Patriot. So this granted American law enforcement unprecedented rights to gather intelligence and to abridge civil liberties in the face of a terrorist threat to the United States. The Patriot Act was passed by Congress by overwhelming margins in 2001. It was renewed in 2006, and it was once again extended by President Obama in 2011. Section 412 of the last version of the anti-terrorism legislation permits indefinite detention of immigrants and other non-citizens. Now, the misdemeanor violation of crossing the border without proper documentation now turned into a terrorist act. And according to the ACLU, Section 412 requires that immigrants certified by the Attorney General be charged within seven days with a criminal offense or an immigration violation, which need not be on terrorism grounds. However, immigrants who are found not to be deportable for terrorism but have an immigration status violation, such as overstaying a visa, could face indefinite detention if their country refuses to accept them. So detention would be allowed on the Attorney General's finding of reasonable grounds to believe involvement in terrorism or an activity that poses a danger to national security. And detention could be indefinite upon a determination that such, individual, such an individual threatens national security or the safety of the community or any other person. So the Patriot Act, in essence, gave law enforcement even more grounds by which to go ahead and just determine if any undocumented immigrant is a threat to this country and they could go ahead and incarcerate them. And this is exactly what happened. The cases have mounted. So it is within this hysteria that the House of Representatives is going to pass one of the most controversial bills on immigration restriction since the racist 1924 Quota Act. It will be known as the Sensenbrenner Bill. On December 16, 2005, the Border Protection, Anti-Terrorism and Illegal Immigration Reform Con Immigration Control Act of 2005, which is known as H.R. 4437, is going to pass the House of Representatives by a vote, a vote of 239 to 182. This legislation, sponsored by Judiciary Chairman James Sensenbrenner, a Republican from Wisconsin, and Homeland Security Chairman Peter King, a Republican from New York, addressed undocumented immigration by strengthening interior enforcement of immigration laws and enacting additional border security measures. It also penalized anyone with imprisonment who knowingly assisted undocumented workers. And this is the key. It penalized anyone who knowingly assisted undocumented workers. So what's going to happen is that immigrants, along with those people who service the immigrant community, are going to stage massive protests throughout the United States, and they're going to challenge labor unions to take a stand. So immigrants, <coughs> excuse me, in 1996, I mean in 2006, are going to resurrect May Day as a day of solidarity. And every May Day since 2006, there are demonstrations that demand that immigrant workers be treated with respect and dignity. 
Let's go and visit the original protest in Washington, D.C. on that great, uh, on, on those days of, uh, that the Sensenbrenner bill was passed. Let's go to film clip number five and look at protests. I'm Jason Rosenberg for Politics TV here in Washington, D.C. We're here with the protesters behind us protesting H.R. 4437, a bill that would outlaw or criminalize anybody who came here illegally. It would also make a felon anybody who helped anybody who came here illegally, including anybody in the clergy and teachers. The H.R. 4437 that went through in December affects me just as much as it affects everybody else because it criminalizes things I do every day, like English as a second language classes. Well, we're brother and sister. We're on opposite sides of the political spectrum. We're both here because we feel like this is some hateful legislation that uh, it, it just shouldn't be passed. Honestly, it will not solve the problems that we're experiencing with illegal immigration. All it will do is push people further into the shadows of society. I myself am a social worker, and I work with a lot of undocumented immigrants. It would criminalize my act of helping children and families, and I just don't see how that is helping anyone. You know that criminals. Yeah. Um, we should be treated like everybody else is treated. What does it mean to be an American? To be an American means to do this, to practice democracy. And this is what we're doing, to express our rights, to fight for our rights. What does it mean to you to be an American, to you and to your family? It means a lot. We have freedom, which we don't have in our countries. And that's why we're trying to come here to this country where we think we, we would have a better life for our kids. The, the magic word is freedom. There's a lot of people here from other places and it's wrong to be considering them as a, a criminal. You know, they come here to make a better life for their kids. In the crowd you hear over and over again that people are afraid of, be, of making felons out of 12 million people, including priests, including teachers, including social workers. This is a very scary bill to some who feel that they can be thrown in jail for years for doing nothing more than trying to live the American dream. If we help anybody who is undocumented, if we do what our calling called us to do, then we could also be put in jail or penalized. It is terrible. It is not what America stands for. I think it makes a difference for us to t uh, take our time out of our life to make a statement of how important it is to include people and treat people like humans, no matter where they come from, no matter where they are. This, this is what we stand for as a country, and this is what we should stand for as individuals. This is a lot bigger than people think. The, the people who are are the mean-spirited ones making the most noise are obviously in a very small minority compared to what we have here. And I would say that to Senator Voinovich, Senator DeWine, and our Representative Bob Ney. If I let a, a bill stop me from helping someone in need, then I too will need help. And then all of humanity will then begin to cripple. I must be there for all people. I will be, I will willingly go to jail. At the protest today on the Mall, Politics TV has spoken to dozens and dozens of people, from teachers to illegal immigrants to priests to doctors, and they've all said the same thing. They just want to be free. They just want to be able to work. They just want to be able to do their jobs in order to help people. With 100,000 people on the mall protesting HR 4437, I'm Jason Rosenberg for Politics TV. It is under this cloud of hysteria and with regards to the Immig Illegal Immigration Responsibility Act that allowed for Section 287G agreements, it's under this cloud of hysteria that a conservative and a reactionary state assembly will pass one of the most racist pieces of legislation that will give rise to a fascist pig, who I understand is running for the Senate now, but he was a sheriff in Maricopa County. And it was known as Arizona Senate Bill 1070, or SB 1070 as it became popularly known. And it made it a state misdemeanor crime 
for an immigrant to be in Arizona without carrying the required documents. It required that state law enforcement officers attempt to determine individual's immigration status during, quote-unquote, a lawful stop, detention, or arrest. When there is reasonable suspicion that the individual is an illegal immigrant. So the law barred state or local officials or agencies from restricting enforcement of federal immigration laws. And it imposed penalties on those sheltering, hiring, and transporting unregistered immigrants. <clears throat> this law encouraged racial profiling. This law encouraged the violation of civil rights. And this law led to movements for change boycotts and protests that still resonate today. So we're going to go to Democracy Now! We're going to listen to Juan Gonzalez assess the situation back in 2010 when SB 1070 was passed. Problemas Raciales by Legendario, and it's specifically about the SB 1070 law. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We go now to Arizona, where Wednesday's federal ruling temporarily blocking key provisions of, of, of that state's notorious anti-immigrant law, Senate Bill 1070, has done nothing to quell the fierce debate around immigration. Arizona Governor Jan Brewer swiftly appealed a ruling by U.S. District Judge Susan Bolton. Politicians in 18 states said they wanted to push similar measures, and protesters rallied from coast to coast, demonstrating against the Arizona law. In Phoenix, hundreds came out early Thursday morning to protest and state civil disobedience actions. This is Sharon Lungo, one of the hundreds of demonstrators who arrived in a caravan from California to protest in the streets of Phoenix. Yesterday's ruling was was not a victory. It was a it was a it, it was a compromise. It, it it doesn't represent the dignity that that people here are representing today by taking the streets, by putting themselves on the line, by putting themselves at risk to tell to tell the people of this world that that we deserve human rights, that all people deserve human rights, that that borders are are their political lines that are drawn by other people. At least 50 people were arrested by federal officers, Phoenix police officers and Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio's deputies. Among those arrested were civil rights leader Salvador Reza of the organization Puente, former state Senate Majority Leader Alfredo Gutierrez, and two legal observers, attorney Sunita Patel of the Center for Constitutional Rights and Roxana Orell of the National Lawyers Guild. In addition, longtime Arizona Republic photographer Dave Siebert was detained and handcuffed for two hours. Ernesto Lopez was among several demonstrators who chained themselves to the Phoenix jail. I'm not too happy about Arpaio being out in the community today. I'm not too happy about uh, Obama sending troops down to the border. And it doesn't look like reform is going to happen anytime soon. So we feel like we have to do something to make Obama listen. Not just Obama, not just Arpaio, and John Brewer, everybody listen. And that laws like SB 1070 are not, uh, are not just. It's not just in Arizona, but these, these type of things are happening all over the state, all over the country, and we're, we're fed up. Meanwhile, here in New York, hundreds marched across the Brooklyn Bridge in a solidarity march on Thursday morning. I'm Leticia Lanis from the organization La Union in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I think it's important that everybody raise their voices against um, SB 1070 and all other uh, bills that try to criminalize immigrants. Immigrants are our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and they contribute to this country. So we should stand up now and really recognize their contributions. Uh, my name is Kevin Davis. Um, I'm actually a youth organizer for the Yaya Network, which is youth activists, youth allies. But honestly, we're all one country and we're all united. So the fact that one state is hurting, all of us are hurting. The fact that one race is hurting, all of us are hurting. Well, I'm Clementina from Vamos Unidos. We are here to support our brothers and sisters from Arizona. SB 1070 affects us everywhere. We started to see our street vendors right here in New York when as soon as the, the law was implied over there in Arizona, a week later, they were asking us for our immigration status to renew our vendor's license or take our vendor's license. So my name is Monami Molik and I am the executive director of DRUM. DRUM stands for Daisies Rising Up and Moving. Whatever happened
happens in Arizona, those same anti-immigrant policies find their way up all throughout the United States. For the last 10 years, Arizona has been a testing ground for the harshest anti-immigrant policies. And so, for example, the governor of New York State signed secure communities already in New York, which has not yet gone into effect but will. And when it does, it will funnel thousands more into deportation. Just across the river, the governor has signed the 287G program, authorizing police officers to arrest people based on immigration status. So we feel that Arizona, maybe that law is not happening here, but there are many other harsh anti-immigrant deportation provisions that our communities are feeling right here in New York City. My name is Sarah, and I'm part of the Boycott Arizona New York City Committee. Um, we had a press conference uh, for support of Resolution 022. And um, at City Hall this Tuesday, the resolution um, 0224 is a, a declaring of an official boycott against Arizona State, and that would mean any business travel that would be going in Arizona would be ba would be barred. Anyone from here going there, um, municipal bonds would not be accepted from Arizona. Also, conventions and uh, any any type of business, we just would not we would not hold any business with Arizona pro-immigrant rights activists who walked over the Brooklyn Bridge yesterday here in New York, interviewed by Nicole Salazar and Andalusia Noel. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. As we turn now to back to Phoenix, to Carlos Garcia, the lead organizer for the Puente Movement. Welcome to Democracy Now! Can you talk about what happened yesterday in Arizona and where you're going from here, Carlos? Sure. Yesterday was a very intense day here in Phoenix, Arizona. We had 83 people arrested in total in three different sites, three at a federal courthouse, 50 in front of the Sheriff Joe Arpaio's offices, and 30 um, shutting down Arpaio's jail. Also, five individuals were arrested the day before. We had uh, one great accomplishment yesterday. Because of our actions, we were able to postpone Sheriff Arpaio's sweep of, of our community, meaning families were not separated and the community was not terrorized, at least for the periods of time that we were protesting. I mean, the Saturday actions that happened across the country, I think the message was, was heard loud and clear that we will not put up with, with what is left of SB 1070, we will not put up with Sheriff Joe Arpaio, not put up with 287G or secure communities. Um, I think moving forward here in Phoenix, what we're, we're, we're doing is really uh, concentrating on organizing our community, building what, what we're calling Barrio Defense Committees, committees that will in turn help us strategize and fight back against future bills um, like SB 1070 and politicians like Russell Pierce and Joe Arpaio. Uh, Carlos Garcia, there's been some uh, uh, uncertainty in terms of the, bo of the boycott situation. I know that U.S. Representative Raul Grijalva, immediately after the court decision, called for an end to the boycott What is of Arizona. What's your position on that issue? We are, are remaining strong that, that we need to, to continue to boycott Arizona, um, not only because of the pieces left in 1070, but also what, what Sheriff Joe Arpaio is, is continuing to do here in Arizona. I, I don't know if folks understand that uh, yesterday, laws, uh, new laws came into effect with 1070 that the day before that we did not have. We now have to deal with anti-solicitation bills that are targeting day laborers. Uh, uh, municipalities and police agencies are forced to work under federal enforcement. They, it's, it's what they call the anti-sanctuary uh, city uh, piece. And, and then we have really concerning uh, law that's coming into effect with SB 1070 in regards to transportation and housing. That can make it a crime if someone is driving or housing an undocumented person. The, the, the question we have with that is, is anyone that enters your home or that you're giving a ride to, are you going to have to ask for their passport or else people will then be liable for criminal charges? So I think the pieces that were left of, of SB 1070 are really intense, and, and, and folks are, are failing to see that, yes, it could have been a lot worse with the pieces that were taken out, but it's still a really bad situation with the new law of SB 1070. Carlos Garcia, will your protests continue? Our protests will continue. We will continue to organize in our community. And, and, and if, if, if yesterday we were able to accomplish in stopping Joe Arpaio uh, for, because of individuals that are going to be able to maybe be detained one or two days and then released, if that's going to mean stopping uh, deportations or long-term detention or, or people being separated with, um, from their families, we really have to consider as a community here in Arizona to start doing that. Carlos Garcia, we want to thank you for being with us, lead organizer for the Puente movement, as we turn now to Dave Zyrand. 
one. Well, the world in the world. Now, the fascist pig posing as sheriff for Maricopa County in Arizona and praised by Donald Trump for his racial profiling is Joe Arpaio. Now, he took advantage of the 287G agreements and the provisions of the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. It permitted local law enforcement agencies to designate officers to perform immigration law enforcement functions, and he took it to new heights. His aggressive efforts to hunt down and detain undocumented immigrants made him a national symbol of the divisive politics of immigration, and it eventually earned him a criminal contempt conviction of which Donald Trump, once he gets into office, will, he will pardon as a symbol. And this racist man went after any Mexican, any Mexican, because he thought they all should be deported. Now let's listen to Juan Gonzalez address this fascist conviction. Now let's go to, um, right here, film clip number seven from Democracy Now! Okay, <clears throat> Thank you. Now, um, Ever since the passage of the Clinton Immigration Reform Bill of 1996 and the Patriot Act of 2001, the border between the United States and Mexico has turned into a war zone. Undocumented workers have become the new terrorists, and the prison industry is profiting from their unfortunate circumstances. Now, according to a May 2011 report by Detention Watch Network, since the late 1990s, the number of people held in immigration detention has exploded. On any given day, ICE detains over 33,000 immigrants. And this report came out in 2011, so we're like seven years ago. And the report shares that this is more than triple the number of beds since 1996. So in, uh, from 2006 to, to 2011, the annual number of immigrants detained and the cost of detaining them doubled. In 2010, the report continues, approximately 392,000 immigrants were detained, costing taxpayers $1.77 billion at an average of $122 a day per bed. Nearly 2.5 million individuals have passed through immigration detention facilities since 2003. For immigrants, this expansion has meant weeks, months, and sometimes years in jail, often under inhumane conditions, with little or no access to counsel, to family, or to the outside world. But for private prison corporations, this expansion has meant huge profits. The states with the highest average daily populations in private facilities in 2009 were Texas, coming in at 6,115, Georgia coming in at 1,804, and Arizona coming in at 1,779. And this was a 2009 statistics. So the three largest corporations invested in immigration detention today are the Cor Cor Corrections Corporation of America, the GEO Group Incorporated, and the Management and Training Corporation. So the private prison industry has been very explicit about its intentions to influence immigration detention policy and practice in accordance with its own profit motive. So when Trump came to power, their stock value increased tremendously. Let's listen to how the election of Donald Trump meant a boondoggle for the, president and for the, for the prison industry. It is here that we go to film clip eight, Democracy Now! Now, <clears throat> according to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, on June 5, 2012, the Secretary of Homeland Security announced that certain people who came to the United States as children and meet several guidelines may request consideration of deferred action for a period of two years subject to removal. I mean, subject to renewal. I'm sorry, that's a very key word, renewal. They are also eligible for work authorization. Deferred action is the use of prosecutorial discretion 
to defer removal action against an individual for a certain period of time. Deferred action does not provide lawful status or legality. Deferred action of childhood arrivals, known as DACA, was implemented by President Obama because of his benevolence. Or not because of his benevolence, but it took over a decade of organizing by youth to have Congress listen to their struggle. And they went in and occupied Obama's uh, offices as he was running for president to at least help them pass what was known as the DREAM Act. Now the DREAM Act, the acronym for Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors, that was a legislative proposal for a multi-phase process for qualifying undocumented minors in the United States, granting conditional residency, and upon meeting further qualifications, then maybe permanent residency. The bill was first introduced on the Senate in August 1st, 2001. It was known as Senate Bill 1291 by United States Senator Dick Durbin and Orrin Hatch. And it has been reintroduced several times, but the DREAM Act has failed to pass a divided Congress. Resistance efforts by the DREAMers finally got the Obama administration to do something about their unique status because Obama was not about to do anything to help immigrants. In fact, Obama is on record as having deported more immigrants than any other president, even more than Donald Trump so far. Now, the deferred action for childhood arrivals is because of these youth who challenged Obama to do something for their status. DACA allowed some individuals who entered the country as minors and had either entered or remained in the country illegally to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action for deportation and to be eligible for a work permit. And as of 2017, approximately 800,000 individuals referred to as DREAMers after the DREAM Act bill were enrolled in the program that was created by DACA. Now, the policy was established by the Obama administration in June 2012, and it has been rescinded by this Trump administration. It was rescinded just last September of 2017. Let's listen to an interview last May with a DACA organizer, and let's appreciate something with regards to how these students are hanging in the balance. We turn now to 21-year-old Karime Andujar, who came to the United States from the Dominican Republic with her family at the age of four. She's in her third year studying chemical engineering at Rutgers University, where she's been an outspoken advocate for undocumented students. Andujar is the president of Undocu Rutgers and the recipient of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, under President Obama. She was waiting for renewal of her status when she received a letter from Federal Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE, ordering her to report for a check-in on Tuesday morning. Immigrant rights advocates say Andujar may now face deportation. Uh, Karimada Andujar, welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you. Uh, tell us about your situation uh, when you received uh, this notice to report. Mm -hmm. So I received the notice about um, seven to eight weeks ago, and the notice said that I had to report for an interview with a deportation officer at the Federal ICE Building in Newark. Uh, and uh, you've been very active in, in the—at uh, Rutgers University, among the undocumented students. Talk about your work there. Um, so, uh, my advocacy first started by starting Rutgers' first student organization for undocumented students. I started the organization with the objective of providing resources, um, as well as support to undocumented students to improve the um, graduation rates and as well as retention rates um, for undocumented students, because they're currently very low for higher education. And uh, what is your fear uh, of deportation? Have you seen uh, uh, other students, either at Rutgers or students that you know who, uh, who have, were initially granted DACA, who then have subsequently been deported? Yes, there was a national case a couple of weeks ago of a DACA recipient who was actually either out to lunch or out to dinner with his girlfriend. Um, and then ICE officials 
started to ask him questions. That very same day, he was later deported to um, Mexico. So that's a direct um, violation of the regulation set forth by DACA, because DACA is supposed to be deportation protection for early childhood arrivals. Uh, and tell us a little bit about your story. You came from the Dominican Republic where you, when you were four years old, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you lived and studied where in New Jersey all of your life? Yes. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what it's been like being here undocumented for so many years. Um, well, first and foremost, I consider America my home, without a doubt. I've been living in the same house for 15 to 16 years, um, so undoubtedly, I do consider this my home. Growing up undocumented was challenging because there's um, a lot of fear and there's also a lot of uncertainty, and it also poses a lot of challenges trying to obtain a higher um, education degree. So some of those challenges include not being able to um, get federal financial aid or any form of financial aid, as well as it does pose um, it does make it more difficult to also apply for like loans. So financially, it it's a lot of strain. Well, uh, during a February news conference, President Trump was asked if he planned to continue or end the DACA program. This was his response. We're going to show great heart. DACA is a very, very difficult subject for me, I will tell you. To me, it's one of the most difficult subjects I have, because you have these incredible kids, in many cases, not in all cases. In some of the cases, they're having DACA and they're gang members and they're drug dealers, too. But you have some absolutely incredible kids, I would say mostly. They were brought here in such a way. It's a very, it's a very, very tough subject. We are going to deal with DACA with heart. I have to deal with a lot of politicians, don't forget, and I have to convince them that what I'm saying is, is right, and I appreciate your understanding on that. Your reaction to President Trump's uh, statements and also to his general approach so far to the immigration issue uh, in the country? Well, this statement comes after a lot of dehumanizing rhetoric. Um, mainly targeting not only immigrants in general, but also specifically undocumented immigrants. So it came as a bit of surprise, just because perhaps he didn't realize when he was first speaking that when he speaks about undocumented people, he's also speaking about DACA recipients, because it's not only a DACA recipient versus non-DACA recipient, because, you know, non-DACA recipients are our parents. They're also... Um, they're, you know, they're in the same struggle as us, where our struggle is one and the same. Now, at Rutgers, the, uh, the university officials have declared the university a safe space uh, for undocumented students. There's a, uh, a, a sort of an equivalent to so the sanctuary cities that have developed around the country. Your, your response to how the university has dealt with your case and the, I know the faculty union has been very supportive and is mobilizing people to appear with you uh, Tuesday morning uh, at, the, at, the federal, uh, at the federal building there. So I have received incredible support, as you said, from the faculty union as well as various professors at the university. Um, I have heard that some students have been reaching out to Barchi, which is the president of the university, for to get him to voice his um, support for not only myself but also other undocumented students in my situation. I have not heard, um, I have not heard feedback from that, but I. I do know that the Senate approved a motion in support of undocumented students. So as of right now, what we have seen um, from the administration is a lot of emails by support—sorry, support from emails. So we receive a lot of emails um, stating their support for undocumented students. But, you know, this is a case where now is the time for them to um, prove and demonstrate their support, not only in emails, um, but, you know, when in action case arises, well, are they willing to kind of um, go against the national rhetoric and support an undocumented student? So you'll be going to your ICE check-in uh, Tuesday morning, tomorrow morning at 8.30 in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, you'll be accompanied by who and what, and what do you expect to happen? Uh, well, my interview is at 9. I, I do expect to get there early, so around 8.30. Um, so, because of the support that I have been receiving, as I said, not only from um, my university, but also 
communities and um, local officials, I don't think that they are going to deport or detain me. Um, because several senators, um, as well as Congress people, have been in contact with ICE, um, letting them know that there is— U.S. Senator Cory Booker has, yes. uh, is supporting you? Yes. Uh, U.S. Senator Cory Booker, as well as um, Senator Bob Menendez, they have also—I have also been in contact with them, and they have been um, supporting me, as well as Congre Congressman Pallone and Congressman Pascrell. Um, so because of the support that I have received, the tremendous amount of support that I have received, um, I don't think that they'll be um, deporting or detaining me. Uh, well, best of luck to you in, 